book it. If you want to turn your Bibles to uh, the book of Judges, and it's pa- if you grab one of these Bibles on the way in, it's page 203. Uh, the uh, this is, verses will be up behind us here, so you'll be able to follow along, no problem. But today, we, I was going to do Samson, but I couldn't get past Gideon. I just couldn't get past Gideon, so I'm going to have to wait a couple weeks for Samson. So Gideon, God can use even you. God can use even me. All right, that's the, the title. Gideon, God can use anyone and everyone to accomplish his purposes. Anybody, he can use us. Uh, Veterans Day was last week. I didn't forget we were planning on doing the Gideon. No, I'm kidding. I did. Todd wasn't here, and I'm, I'm, I'm you, know, you know me. But anyway, vets, uh, I know Todd already mentioned them, but I just want to have them stand. When I mention them, Chuck Harrison's not here, but uh, Chuck was in the Navy. And um, let's see, Mark Smith is up doing security, of course. And Mark was in the Air Force, Air Force. All right, good, help me out here. Uh, Walt Ryan is here. Where's Walt? Was in the Navy Navy pilot, pilot, Navy pilot, right? Still flying today, super. And then also Jake, where's Jake? Jake was in the Army. Army, Army. Thank you, Jake. All right, during the Vietnam era. And Bob Noble was in lots of different things. Bob was in the Coast Guard, Coast Guard, and then he's fireman and policeman. He did it all, but thank you. Uh, Jim Conover is not here. He's not able to be here, but he was in the Marines, right? Jim Conover. And, uh, and also, I, I got to mention Julie Bunce's husband, right? Uh, Howard was in the... Navy, Navy, he is in heaven now. Did I forget anybody? Because I know we have others, but I was trying to think of who actually would be here today. So, who? Not me. Who? <laughs> oh, your whole family. Okay, I got you, your whole family. All right, good. Yeah, I was trying to think of who uh, was going to actually be here. And Memorial Day, we remember everybody. We read their names and all. But on Veterans Day, I want to remember the people who were here. Okay, so perfect timing because we're doing the Foundational Testament series. And we're in the book of Judges, and we, I just couldn't resist hitting Gideon. Couldn't resist hitting Gideon and his fighting men, his fighting men. So it's the perfect timing for the book of Gideon. And let me pray again. Father, we thank you for the worship, oh, the spirit moving in our hearts through that worship. And Lord, we thank you for every person who's here today or out there listening somewhere today. We pray that your Holy Spirit would touch us. Your Holy Spirit would touch us and and move us forward spiritually, powerfully. And if anybody is here or out there who's never put their faith in Jesus Christ, that today would be the day of their salvation. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so Judges 6, I could, just couldn't get past this one. You know, I want to do Sam's, but I just, the Holy Spirit kept... You know, you know, Gideon, Gideon, and I'm so glad I did. It's an awesome story. Judges chapter 6 through 8, and once again, the titles, God can use even us, even us, and God can use anyone to accomplish his purposes. Let's pick it up. Isaiah, I'm sorry, Isaiah, Jeremiah, help me, Judges, <laughs> Judges. I, I'm stuck in my Isaiah, Jeremiah, I, have to, I didn't say Lamentations, I stopped. Judges 6. Verse 1, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and the other eastern people invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them or their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. So here we go. We have the cycle. Remember the sin cycle we talked about last time in the book of Judges? And we see, first of all, their sin, right? They had idolatry. And then after that came the oppression, right? The oppression. The Amalekites and Midianites came, the, the oppression. And then the next step was they, well, they did kind of repent. They cried out to the Lord for help, which hopefully involved repentance, but they cried for help. And what came out next in that cycle? God sent a 
judge, a deliverer to help them, right? Okay, so sin, oppression, crying out for help, God sends a judge, a deliverer, and then sin again, right back in the cycle. Can you believe those people? I know nobody here can relate to that in any way, shape, or form, but, but you might know someone like that. Anyway, uh, they, they send a, a judge here, and the judge, the delivery sends, we already know who it is, verse 11 says, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak at Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Ab Abizarite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior, mighty warrior. So he, he, they pick Gideon, Gideon, okay? He's threshing wheat in a wine press. <clears throat> Why a wine press? Nobody threshes wheat in a wine press. He's hiding, right? Hiding, trying to keep it quiet. He's doing his, his he's, he's hiding his self, himself. He's hiding his work. He's hiding the wheat. It's like they, the wine presses were cave-like. You know, we already saw that. It's like hiding in your basement, you know, and, and, and not letting anybody find you. All right. So anyway, the Lord is with you. The, the angel of the Lord says, the Lord is with you. And Gideon asks, how is this possible? He says, verse 13, Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. So he not only questions, and this is but just, I'm going to give it away. It's God speaking to him. It's a theophany or a Christophany. We're going to see that in a few minutes. Uh, he, he not only questioned what this message from God was, but he's actually blaming God, you know? Did not you do this? And but now, and you have abandoned us. The, the victim mentality it didn't start with USA Today. Oh no, no, the victim mentality. You know uh, that we we make mistakes, and then we blame God when God does. You know, you know, judges that, right? Uh, it's obvious here that Gideon is not super faithful. He was too busy with his harvest and hiding to uh, to. He missed a very key sermon. A very key sermon, or, or and even if he missed the sermon, he didn't listen to the podcast either, because we can see what oh, this. He should have already known the answer to this, because just a few verses before this, look at verse seven. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, <clears throat> he sent them a prophet, who said, "This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says: I brought you out of Egypt." out of the land of slavery, rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians, and I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you, in, gave you their land. I said, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the God of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. So what is Gideon doing asking and blaming God when he already should have known what the prophet said? He obviously missed that sermon, didn't listen to the podcast, hint, hint, hint. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> okay, so, but back to Judges 6.12. He says, once again, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And what does Gideon say in verse 15? He says, pardon me, my Lord. He's always pardoning God, right? Uh, pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my family. A mighty warrior, I'm nothing. I am Nobody, right? Nobody. And for once, he's making sense. This is the first time Gideon makes sense in this passage. He's making sense. Because this is the truth. He's a wimp in hiding. He's a wimp hiding out in a, in a wine press, you know? Uh, it's a, but it's, that's exactly why God picked him, as we will see. That's exactly why he was picked. Then God gives him a direct command. Verse 14, he says... The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hands. Am I not sending you? So he said, go, save, I'm sending, all right? Go, save them, I'm sending them. And the very next words out of Gideon's mouth, which we already read, but I'm going to read it again. The very next words out of Gideon's mouth was, uh, what version is this? That's, I don't think that's, did we get the wrong? Okay, anyway, I'm going to read it out of mine. It, well, it says, but, but, okay, pardon me, the word I wanted, but, because whenever, whenever God gives a command, we say, but, that's not a good idea, okay? But 
my Lord, Gideon replied, uh, oh, well, it goes on a little further. But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Massa, and I'm the least in my family. He, he says, but how can I? But how can I? You know, when God gives us a command, we should follow unless we can't figure out how he's going to do it. Right? Then we're allowed to say, but how can I do that? I know what it says in God's word, but, but how can, I can't live like this. I can't overcome that. I can't, you know, celebrate recovery, defeat that. I can't, I, you know, but I can't witness to this person. I can't share my faith. I, you know, the, you get my point? What does this expose? Gideon is not only a weak wimp, but he has weak faith. He's a weak wimp and he has weak faith. So God gives him a stronger exhortation. In verse 16, he says, the Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. And how does Gideon respond again? Verse 17. Okay, God, I'll go right now. Oh, no, that's not what he said. He said, Gideon replied, if I have now found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. <laughs> Crazy, right? I mean, he's face to face with God in human flesh. A theophany, possibly a Christophany, but definitely a theophany. Face to face, give me a sign. This is not how we should respond to God's clear commands. We see a clear command. We're not supposed to say, uh, 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 give me a sign. If we read something in his word, what are we supposed to do? Do it. Just do it. That should be a commercial. Just do it, right? Uh, we should just obey. So don't emulate Gideon, don't copy him who tests God twice. We're going to see him test God, not just this time, but again. So the first says, I'm just going to summarize. I'm not going to read it to him. I'm going to summarize it. He, he offers a sacrifice to the angel of the Lord, which is God, all right? And the angel touches it, and poof, fire comes out of the rock and burns it up. And, and then he knows, oh, my goodness, this really is God himself, the Aphonie or Christophany, right? God then says, okay, now you know who I am for sure, now, I want you to go down and tear down your dad's altar to Baal. That's right, his father worshipped Baal. Most of the Israelites were worshiping Baal by this time. Crazy, right? In fact, part of uh, Gideon's real name was Baal. That was his, he had a, a hyphenated name, which we'll see in a little bit. But Baal was, he was named after Baal. Gideon was. Crazy, right? Uh, but so he says, go down and tear down the altar to Baal and the Asherah pole that goes with it. Okay? Remember what, what the, 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 Altar to Baal and the Asherah pole meant two things, sexual immorality and child sacrifice. That's what was connected to both of them, right? And what, so Gideon promptly does go and do it. Well, actually, he waited till it was dark out. He went till everybody was sleeping, <laughs> and then he did it, because he's still a big wimp. Still a big chicken. Then Gideon calls after this, after tearing it down and feeling kind of good about himself, he then calls the Israelites to fight in verse 33. He says, now all the, uh, uh, yeah, verse 33, now all the Midianites, Malachites, and other eastern people joined forces and crossed over the Jordan and camped in the valley of Jezreel. Then the spirit of the Lord came on Gideon, and he blew a trumpet summoning the Abbey. Abizarites to follow him. He sent messengers throughout Manasseh, calling them to arms and also into Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali. So they too went up to meet them. Okay, so he, uh, did I get them all? Yeah, okay. Then, then after blowing the trumpet and calling the army and being excited, he loses his nerve again. He loses his nerve again. And, and listen what he says to God this time, verse 36. He says, Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand as you have promised, look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there is dew only on the fleece and all the ground is dry, then I know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you said. And that is what happened. Gideon arose early the next day. He squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew, a bowl full of water. Woo, okay, good, good. Uh, Gideon's fleece. This is test number two. This is the first one was burning up the, the sacrifice on the rock. This is test number two, which he asked God to do a second time, believe it or not. Verse 39, where it says, Then Gideon said to God, Do not be angry with me. <laughs> Let me make just 
One more request. Allow me one more test with the fleece. But this time make the fleece dry and let the ground be covered with dew. He wants a dry fleece and a wet ground. All right? That night God did so. Only the fleece was dry. All the ground was covered with dew. I have heard so many people say to me, I'm not, what sh I'm not sure what I should need to do. I need to lay out a fleece so I know how, what God wants me to do. I wish I had a dollar for every person who has said that to me. Every time I've heard a Christian say, I just need to lay out a fleece. And I say, no, go to God's word. Go to your knees. Go to your knees. And now, it, sometimes if you're still not sure, we can look for an open or closed door, but it's not a fleece. There's, the fleece was, a, was a, 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 a lack of faith, all right? We never, when we have a clear command from God's word, we never ask for a fleece. That's what he was doing. He had a clear command, and he still asked God to give him a fleece. That's not what we're supposed to copy, okay? When we have God's word, we just follow it. I, I've heard it all. You would... I, I can't even tell you some of the stories I've heard about the fleece. This guy was doing, gonna date somebody improperly. It was totally wrong, and and he and I said, you can't do this. What are you doing? He goes, well, I, I can because I, I laid out a fleece. I, I said, God, if you want me to date this person, even though it was really wrong, uh, I, you, if you want me to date him, then put this song on the radio right now. And you know what? That song came on the radio. And so that's why I decided to date this person, even though you're telling me not to and everybody else is telling me not to. And I said, you the Who's the prince of the power of the air? You know, it's the devil puts the songs on, right? So, so, but he made, I've heard other people say, <clears throat> you know, I'm thinking of leaving my wife and marrying somebody else. I'm just not quite sure if I should yet or not, but I'm going to lay out a fleece and see if God confirms what, what my feelings are telling me to do. I would <laughs> ring their neck, right? I'm like, what are you saying? You never ask, if something goes against God's word, you don't have to ask for a fleece. You don't have to ask for a confirmation. If anybody gives you confirmation, it's not the Holy Spirit giving you that confirmation, right? But it's crazy. Listen, we can, <clears throat> we can look for open and closed doors, but fleeces are not what we should be doing. But when we have a clear lead clear word of God but God is graciously patiently uh, goes along with Gideon because he knows where he is and then he says okay but I've had enough Gideon now it's my turn you've tested me with this fleece now I'm going to do the testing and that's exactly what he is. I'm going to test you and cure you of your weak faith once and for all and look how he cures him chapter 7 verse 1 Early in the morning, Jerubbaal, there he is, that is Gideon. He was named after Baal. His father had an altar to Baal, right? And all his men camped at the spring of Harad. Then the camp, camp of Midian was north, I'm sorry, the camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. The Lord said to Gideon, <clears throat> you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands. Or Israel would boast against me. My own strength has saved me. Now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left while 10,000 remained. Woo. If you're afraid, you can go home. Wait, Gideon, not you. Get back here. <laughs> right? 22,000 people leave. Because God wants to make sure he gets all the credit. He gets all the credit. All the glory. There's no doubt who wins this battle. That's coming. It's not the army and it's not Gideon. And then God says, oh, wait, wait, I'm not done yet. <laughs> Remember, Gideon tested him twice. And now God tests Gideon twice. And he says here in verse 4, But the Lord said to Gideon, There are still too many men. Take them down to the water, and I will thin them out for you there. If I say this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say this one shall not go, he shall not go. So Gideon took <clears throat> the men down to the water. There the Lord told him, Separate those who lap the water with their tongues as a dog laps from those who kneel down to drink. Three hundred of them drank from cupped hands, 
not from their water bottle, cupped hands, lapping like dogs, and all the rest got down on their knees to drink. Okay, so um, the idea here is, is the ones who cupped the water into their hands and stayed on their knees looking around, drinking, he kept them. The ones who stuck their faces into the water, like the Westerns, you know, so thirsty, stuck their heads into the water, gone, 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 gone. Okay, he refined the army uh, from, what did they start with? 32,000 to 22,000 to 300. What's that? 10,000 10, down to 300, right? Okay, so from 32,000 down to 300. Guys, that's what he took it down to. He refined the army. And God says, okay, now we are ready. Verse 7. The Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the others go home. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but kept the 300 who took over the provisions and trumpets of the other now the camp of Midian lay below him in the valley. So he, he, he listened. This time he actually did what God wanted. He had two tests and he passed both tests, right? And this, doesn't this remind you of Jesus Christ? Remember Jesus had massive crowds following him. Everybody wanted the bread. Everybody wanted the healing. Everybody wanted to overturn the Romans. And what did Jesus say? He started preaching some really hard sermons. The next thing you knew, there were only a small group there. He preached his big church down to a small group. Jesus didn't probably never went to any of the church growth, you know, seminars in our country. He didn't learn how to be a purpose-driven church or a seeker-sensitive church. He was spirit-sensitive and, you know, God's purpose-driven. You get my point. He... He whittled his, his little group down to 12 rejects. Even after Jesus died and rose again from the dead, there were only how many believers in Jerusalem? 120 gathered. About as many people as we have here gathered. That was it. To start his church. The church today in the United States is bloated. It's bloated. It's bloated with a lot of people that don't, they're just there for the bread. They're just there for who knows what they're there for. It's bloated. There's a lot of false, woke people in these churches. And I challenge my pastor friends, my former friends, I challenge them to preach the truth. Because we'll talk about true issues like child sacrifice. They say, well, I just can't mention that. Half of my church would be upset. Now, you know what I'm going to say. I say, if half of your church is upset that you preach about child sacrifice and repentance, and I'm not talking about mercy and grace. We talk about abortion all the time, and, but God's mercy and grace. I said, you've got to preach mercy and grace. There's a lot of women suffering from what they've done. And men, you've got to offer them healing, which we do. But you also have to speak the truth in love. And, and if half of your church will walk out, if you preach on that, then you have been unfaithful in the pulpit. On, uh, the, the, and that's, the, these are fake Christians. <laughs> if they don't agree that you know, what God's word says clearly, if you are only preaching part of the word, if you, if you can't preach the full Bible without a lot of them leaving, then they're not real. They're fake, fake. And I tell them, you need to lose those people. You, either, you have to preach the truth, and either they be, truly get saved and have a biblical worldview, or they leave mad. Either way, the church is refined and purified. We want them to be saved. We want them to stay. We want them to grow. But, but if they won't do that, they reject the gospel of Jesus Christ, they reject God's word, then they, don't, they shouldn't be there if they're keeping you from being faithful in the pulpit. And, and I, I said it's called addition by subtraction. Right? And, and Jesus Christ 
taught about pruning, the importance of pruning. I grew up on the farm and you had to prune off some branches that were not very healthy and they were dead, a lot of them. You had to do it so that the tree could produce better fruit. Did you know before a lot of the revivals, I've studied revival extensively. Before the revivals, the great awakenings, often the pastors would preach powerfully and courageously and their churches shrunk down shrunk. And that's when the Holy Spirit touched those churches. That's when the Holy Spirit moved because the, 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 the dead branches were pruned away. And that's exactly what God is teaching us here. He's teaching us that, that, that we, we need to be, we need to preach the truth in love. We need to let God refine us in our churches. But back to Gideon, God knew Gideon was still a chicken. He was still scared. You know, he's, you know, you know Gideon's like, why, he can read Gideon's thoughts. Why wasn't I allowed to go home? And you said everybody was scared. Go, why couldn't I go? I was scared, right? And, and during the drinking, Gideon, Gideon's thinking, I put my whole head under water. I almost drowned myself trying to get set home. But you didn't let me go home. You know, uh, I'm adding a few things here. But, but, he, but Gideon was scared. Gideon was scared. God knew it. So God said in Judges 7, verse 9, he said this. During the night, the Lord said to Gideon, get up, go down against the camp because I'm going to give it into your hands. If you are afraid to attack, which means I know you're afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Pura and listen to what they are saying. Afterward, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. So he and Pura, his servant, went down to the outposts of the camp. The Midianites and Amalekites and all the other eastern <coughs> people had settled in the valley thick as locusts. The, their camels could no more be counted than the sands of the seashore. Gideon arrived just as a man was telling a friend his dream. I had a dream, he said, was saying. A round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. His re friend responded, this can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash. The Israelite. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands, into his hands. Gideon was scared, but he arrives and God sends him to listen, play I spy here. And he gets there, he plays I spy, and look what he finds. The Midianites were terrified of God and Gideon. Crazy, right? They were terrified of them. And then, finally, the light goes on. Then Gideon gets it. He gets it. Uh, and why, why, would, why would God, why would, he, why would he do this for Gideon? Why? Why would he, let, after all that they've been back and forth with, why would he do this? Because God knows and understands our weakness. He knows. He understands our weakness, right? And this time, even though Gideon was still scared, he didn't demand a sign. He didn't demand another sign. He just sent all those soldiers home, right? He sent them all home. He was obedient this time. And so God allows him to play I spy and look what he finds, right? And then the light goes on, verse 15. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed down and worshiped. He returned to the camp of Israel and called out, if you're in a bad place today, worship. Look at God's word and worship because look what happens next. He says, this is wimpy Gideon. He says, get up. The Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands. He finally gets it. And look how they were commanded to fight. This is even, this is crazy. Verse 16, dividing the 300 men into three companies, he placed trumpets and empty jars in the hands of all of them with torches inside. Watch me, he told them. Follow my lead. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. When I... And all who are with me, blow our trumpets. Then from all around the camp, blow yours and say, For the Lord 
and for Gideon. Gideon and the 300 men with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just after they had changed the guard, they blew their trumpets and broke the jars that were in their hands. The three companies blew the trumpets and smashed the jars, grasping the torches in their left hand and holding in their right hands the trumpets they were to blow. They shouted, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. It's interesting they shouted a sword for the Lord and for Gideon because there was, there was no sword. In one hand, they have a torch. In the other hand, they have a trumpet. There's no way to hold the sword. It's crazy. How could they hold their swords? They, they didn't need to. They didn't need to because in verse 21, it says this, while each of them held his position... Around the camp, all the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. They ran crying. It, it, it's crazy. And there's even more. Verse 22, when the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. They turned on each other and started killing each other. They're, they're, it, 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 it's crazy. I know this is hard to imagine, but imagine the wicked losing a battle in some way and then turning on each other. That's a hard thing to connect to, I know. Anyway, what Gideon ended up calling the other tribes to come and help, and they did use swords. Those other tribes that came did use their swords, but there's no record in the book of Judges of the 300 doing anything except holding up their torches and blowing their trumpets. That's it. That's all there was. What a crazy story. But God often, God often picks the least expected person and works in a way that we never would have guessed possible. Think of our lives. So that he gets all the glory when his purpose is fulfilled. Least expected person, least expected way, so that God gets all the glory when he fulfills his purpose through us. Through us. Our job is just to keep our eyes open for what God is doing. God, what are you doing? What are you doing and what do you want me to do, right? And hold our torches high. Torches high. You are the light of the world. Holding up Jesus Christ for everybody to see and to blow our trumpets. To blow our trumpets. It reminds me of 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 to 18, blowing our trumpets. Uh, at verse 15, according to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. We are listening for the trumpet. We're supposed to be blowing our trumpets. We're supposed to be letting people know that Jesus Christ is coming again and connecting the dots to what is happening in the world with what it says in God's word, especially Daniel and Revelation, right? I want to encourage you to, to know these dots, that Jesus is coming soon and blowing that trumpet, letting everybody know, helping people connect the dots. Why is this happening? What's going on? What's our country? Blah, blah, blah. You know, people are in panic. They're anxious. They're freaking out. And we know what's going on. And we have to connect the dots for them. That's why I have this Connecting the Dots website. If you haven't been listening to it on the, the YouTube, it's on there, and it's on our website too. But it, I'm connecting what's happening in the world with what, is, what is, God's Word is talking about. I also did the Daniel Revelation series. You can listen to that. But, but help people. Share that and help people understand what is going on and why it's going on. Because Jesus Christ is coming again. Connecting the Dots. 
Now let's connect some dots to our own lives before we close here in prayer. And as, 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 here's the connecting to our own life. Is there anyone here whose faith wavers at times? Who is scared about what's going on? Okay, you can all just leave. Just go. <laughs> anyone who finds himself, anybody here who finds himself doubting God's word or his promises at, from time to time? Probably nobody here, but you might know people. So listen, because you're going to have to help these people. Joking, joking. Who, so anyone who just wants to hide from all the spiritual warfare going on out there and all around us, anybody wants to hide like Gideon in a, in a, in a cave? <laughs> who, like Gideon, wants to just tune out, tune out Pastor Chuck's prophetic warnings? <laughs> he didn't listen to the prophet. He was too, didn't want to hear it anymore. Sick of hearing that crazy prophet talking, right? Anybody like that? then Gideon's story is for you, <laughs> for me. It's for all of us, right? This is for us. Gideon is us. God can use anyone, even Gideon's, to accomplish his purpose. Even the weak, even the weak in faith. Do you feel weak? Do you feel weak in faith? How, how, could, how can God use us? Look what happened to Gideon. And in order to find out really what happened to Gideon, we have to look at the fulfilled testament. Hebrews 11. I bet a lot of you have missed this. Hebrews 11, verse 32. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon. Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah. Those are all judges from the book of Judges. Deliverers from the book of Judges. About David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword. Now, here we go. Whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle, and routed foreign armies. Who is he talking about? Gideon. All of them, but Gideon especially. Gideon was at the front of the list, and he ends this list. I don't have time to tell about Gideon, whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. His weakness was turned to strength. And he routed the, he became powerful and beat the enemy. And that's what happened to Gideon. And the same is true for us today in the fulfilled testament. The same is true in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. Listen to this. Connect the dots. But he said to me, talking to Paul, remember? He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. I'm going to read that again. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, in, uh, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Do you get that? If you don't have that one memorized, go home and do it. <laughs> God wants weak people. He wants weak people who will depend on his Power. Are you a broken mess today? I know we're all perfect here, but you might know someone who's a broken mess. Don't deny it. Don't fight it. Don't fight it. Embrace it. Brag about it. Look what Paul said. Brag about it. Let it drive you, let it drive us to God. That's why it's there. So we will depend on him and his power, the power of the Holy Spirit. Book of Acts, remember? The power of the Holy Spirit. And maybe you're here today or listening out there and you're not a Christian yet, but your life is a mess. You're a broken mess. God breaks us. 
He does that to us. So that we will hit the place where we say, God, we hit the wall, we say, God, I can't do this anymore. God, if you're out there, help me. How many of us prayed that prayer? Way back. God, if you're out there somewhere, if you're real, help me. He breaks us to bring us to our knees and to bring us to the cross of Jesus Christ. To realize we need him for our salvation and we need him for our sanctification. We need him for eternal life and we need him for this life all the time. We need Jesus. That we need John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Have you ever put your faith in Jesus Christ? Let's pray. How is the Holy Spirit speaking to us? Maybe you're here or out there somewhere and you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ. You've never given your life to Jesus Christ. But are you now ready to crawl to the cross because that's the only way to get there? On our knees, are you ready to crawl to the cross of Jesus Christ? and surrender your life to Jesus and give your life to him. It's no ritual. You don't need a religious person. You don't need anything. You just, it's between you and God. The prayer of faith. I'm a mess. I'm lost. But I'm turning to you, Jesus. I repent. I'm crawling away from that old life. I'm coming to the cross. where Jesus, you died for me in my place, for my sin, shedding your blood to wash me clean. And then rising from the dead so that I could have a brand new life. Forgive me. I put my faith in Jesus. I surrender my life to you, God. If you have prayed that prayer of faith, then the Holy Spirit you've been hearing so much about today is now inside of you. Has just transformed you into a brand new creation in Jesus Christ. Your life will never be the same. I'm encouraging you to tell somebody. Tell me on the way out. Tell someone here that you know. Let someone know you put your faith in Jesus. If you're out there in your car somewhere listening, tell your grandma who's been praying for you. Tell that teacher who's been witnessing to you. Tell that that friend at work who's been talking to you about Jesus. Tell somebody so that we can be excited for you and encourage you, help you in your new life in Jesus Christ. Help you in the new battles you're going to be facing but you're going to win them now. And for those of us who've already put our faith in Christ, how's the Holy Spirit speaking to us? Are you weak enough 
Are you weak enough for God to use you powerfully? Are we weak enough? Are we depending on God's Holy Spirit, His power? Father, I pray that every one of us would be in the place that you can use us to accomplish your purpose, no matter how impossible it seems. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.